Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to another episode of Reverts Reality. My name is Nahela Morales, and I'm here with my co-host, Orenda Dakka. Today, we have a very special guest, um, Sister Jackie Nicole from our Pennsylvania Embrace chapter. Welcome, ladies. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. How are you all doing? Alhamdulillah. 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 So today we have a very, another very exciting topic. I always say this at the introduction, but I think all of these topics are very much needed to be uh, addressed. And so um, something that we have not uh, spoken about yet on these re, uh, reverts reality is the topic of modesty. So modesty never uh, goes out of style. And Sister Jackie came out, came up with that um, title, mashallah. So I loved it and we ran with it. Um, so we'll start off with the uh, meaning in the dictionary of what is modesty. So modesty is behavior, manner, and appearance intended to avoid inappropriate, inappropriacy and indecency. So, um, Sister Jackie, um, I know that for every one of us is obviously uh, a journey when it comes to our hijab, which most people um, try to pin this whole modesty on the element of a piece of cloth. But we understand that modesty or a hijab is much more than a piece of cloth right on on our head and we saw in the definition here where it says behavior manners and appearance so we understand the appearance is the hijab and manners is the way we carry ourselves when we are wearing this um, piece of cloth uh, which is really uh, for two reasons number one is it automatically identifies us as Muslimas, if we see a Muslima that doesn't wear it, and some Muslimas are not are, are on their own journey, and um, we are of the mentality that we don't criticize anyone, absolutely anyone. Everybody's journey is individual, and so we are very respectful of that. As a matter of fact, we wanted to bring a non-hijabi and a niqabi, but it just didn't work out this week. So perhaps we will continue the conversation or we'll have a part two so we can get their perspective. And again, this is an individual uh, choice. So the second reason, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded it. And it is in all scriptures, Abrahamic scriptures. Um, and Sister Jackie will touch a little bit on that. Um, but even prior to that, I want to ask you, ladies, how difficult was it to, to implement the head covering uh, upon embracing Islam? Sister Jackie, we'll start with you. So, subhanAllah, I have I have a very um, deep love of hijab and head covering. And the reason being is I actually started wearing a head covering almost a year before I converted. Um, I did a lot of research and that's where the hard came, hard, hardness came from. When I was researching Islam, I just couldn't understand the head covering. No matter, I read you know, books about it, I would watch lectures about it, and I'm just like, I don't get it. Uh, and one weekend, uh, I went on a retreat and it was, uh, you know, kind of like a self-help kind of retreat in New York and I planned the whole thing. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to be in a place where nobody knows me uh, and I'm going to try wearing a head cover. And I did it like a turban for a weekend. SubhanAllah. I'm like I'm going to find out like I don't understand and how sometimes I want to get a deep understanding. I need to understand by experience. Um, and I, after that, I never took it off. It felt, you know, right to me. But that doesn't mean that my hijab did not change over time. I actually had a lot of difficulty um, throughout after even converting, you know, increasing my hijab, you know, not wearing it, you know, as a turban or when I wear it as a turban, making sure my neck was covered or my ears were covered, um, you know, and that slowly increased as my men. And that's, you know, the really important thing is that um, you need to have that intention uh, before 
you uh, show it physically sometimes. And even when you're showing it physically as a Muslim, where it's normal, you know, it's a normal thing and it feels like you, um, you know, it's good to have that intention. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you for what you're doing. Um, but for me, it was, it, it increased as uh, my event. How about you, Sister Renda? Assalamualaikum. So um, I, was, I always kind of had a modesty thing going on before I found Islam. Um, it was not uncommon for me to leave my coat on all day at school. People used to kind of ask me, take your coat off, take your coat off. But um, so my progression into it wasn't as difficult, I think, as maybe some people. Uh, um, in terms of covering, when I first embraced Islam, I knew it was something that was obligatory but I wasn't ready to do it at that time because it was just very foreign and you're in circles of people that you don't know anyone who's doing that. So um, I took my time. I was at the masjid all the time learning every weekend. And I had, my son was just a few months old and he was coming every weekend with me. And so when I would go, of course I would cover up when I go into the masjid and the minute I got in my car, I would take it off. And after like a few months, I was like, this is, doesn't feel right. <laughs> So I just did some soul searching and praying. And one day I put my hijab on and my son was maybe six, seven months old. And he just held my face and looked at me like I was the most beautiful person in the world. And I was like, you know what? Alhamdulillah, today's the day. I'm not taking it off. And so since that time, you know, he's almost 21 now. I have not removed it except once during 9-11. And that was for a few hours. Um, and I checked my face. Um, and so it, it was a little bit easier process for me. And I think it was just the educating myself to understand why I was doing it. I wasn't doing it for my husband. I wasn't doing it for my family, my in-laws, um, the people in the community. Um, so I, it wasn't a pressure thing for me. It was a personal choice. And because I think because of that, that's why I was able to hold strong to hijab. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. My story, I think it's a little similar, but with some um, calamity uh, very early on with my hijab. And I've said this a zillion times, so I'll, I'll make it very short and quick. But um, hijab, um, I, I started playing with the hijab prior to embracing Islam, just similar to, you know, going to the mosque and, and praying. And I just felt that was really what kept me from taking my shahada. Honestly, I just felt that I wasn't going to live up to it in the sense of keeping it, you know, full time. And so it was very scary. Um, as Latina, you know, you, our culture is about the hair. It's about, you know, um, kind of, you know, always uh, looking out and making sure everything's in place. Um, so it was very, very scary, the thought that I had to cover everything that you worked so hard for, right, that you go to the beauty parlor for an hour, and all of that is going to be covered. So um, that was very difficult. But eventually, when I did um, take uh, the decision to actually put it on, um, I actually got fired uh, for my job. And so um, I started questioning everything. And it was very scary times because obviously my son was, was still young and um, sole provider, single mom, kind of like I went to my rug and I just kind of, you know, dropped in sujood and said, okay, I know I made the best decision of my life because it just feels right. Now, please guide me. And so I really held on to my dean. And prior to that, I studied Islam for about two years online, and then I started going to classes. So something that you both said, and I think I agree 100%, is, um, you know, education. When you understand why you're wearing it, and that level of a man is up there, um, nothing can, you know, break us or shake us when it comes to our attire. I honestly sometimes actually all the time, I don't even remember that I have it on uh, until I'm reminded or I'm looked at a certain way, or I just, I'm the only hijabi in the room or what have you, then I'm like, oh, okay, I am different. And, I, and it's supposed to be, I am different. I am Muslim. And I take a lot of pride in that, specifically when I go to my native Mexico, that I don't look like people. And I, I always tell my son that I like to be different and, and we are supposed to be different. 
and and we have to be able to identify one another. So when we see another hijabi, what do you, especially in foreign lands, you get all excited, right? You're like, Salam Alaikum. It's like you identify each other. It's like as if your hearts speak to each other, right? Um, or the hijab, whatever. But um, yeah, and so my family didn't take it very well. So um, in terms of family wise, so I lost my job and I couldn't find a job for approximately two years. Uh, so it was very difficult times. But in the midst of all that, I also found a lot of comfort in my new community. So they really, really um, embraced us and took care of us so much so that our lifestyle didn't change because everybody was helping financially. So there wasn't a burden per, per se. And um, the other thing was that I got the opportunity in those two years to really um, dive in learning more about my Dean, which again, reinforced my Iman and took me to another level where it's never crossed my mind to take it off whatsoever. And I lived in the East Coast. I, I, I used to work in New York um, so I used to go through New York City every day. So um, and I was in New York for 9-11. So, um, yeah. So my next question is that for, for all of you in terms of family, how how did your family um, see the hijab or was there any repercussions as far as I know I've heard sisters say, her children, especially if they're older, they don't want to be seen with them. Uh, I had one sister crying to me uh, saying that, you know, her son was embarrassed of her per se. And that happened to me in Mexico as well. And I'll share that later. Um, or the other thing is that um, the parents are not accepting of it as well. So how was it for you, Sister Jackie? So I got, because I started wearing the hijab, over a year before I converted and I you know I did a lot of practices before I converted because you know Islam you know is a lifestyle um and so I figured in my head if this lifestyle is not realistic then what how can it ever be the right path so I need to understand that and so um I got a lot of that very early even before I made my choice you know to convert that my my family didn't understand, you know, my, my mom didn't always approve, she, you know, they would question like, why don't you take it off and all of these things. And uh, even I went to a, a gathering, I, there was my, um, my nephew was getting christened and I went to the christening, um, you know, before I converted and my uncle asked me, uh, why are you dressed like that? Why are you wearing that? And I said, you know, I'm practicing modesty. I'm trying to practice modesty. And, you know, this is just a lifestyle change that I've made. And he went, okay, good. Because if it's something else, you know, how that's going to look on our family. And I was, I was a little like me, like, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like, how is that going to look on our family? And, uh, you know, um, so that, that was a little bit of a shock and to kind of get that, I'm, I'm grateful I got that before I converted because after, after you do convert, there's so many other changes that you have to go through. Um, so it, it made it a little bit easier, uh, in that journey, but, um, certainly, uh, I would get, I have a friend, my best, one of my, I call her my best friend. Her name is Ruth and she's 105. Um, she's, uh, old, you know, she's Jewish woman. Uh, and so I used to walk her dog and then we just became best friends. And so she would, you know, I would go visit her a couple times a week and she went from going, you know, you should really take that off. Your mom isn't happy with it. You know, she would talk to my mom. You should really take it off. Da, da, da. Every time I saw her, subhanAllah, now she'll call me and she'll say, oh, come, come over. My roommate's not going to be here. Her roommate's a man. So you can you can be comfortable here and you can take off your scarf or, oh, come over. My roommate's going to be here so you can wear your scarf. So she kind of like, if she can understand, you know, 105 years old, you know, and be okay with it, um, you know, it's not a lot. anyone can be okay with me wearing hijab. <laughs> so um, I was really lucky to kind of go through those, those difficulties early and be tested early, even before uh, converting. Blessed is a better word. 
Yeah, mashallah, mashallah. How about you, Sister Renda? Did your family, I mean, I know you were living um, away, right? So Right. So they were on the West Coast and I was on the East Coast. And so I didn't get to see them that often, maybe once every year, every couple of years, depending on when I could get home. But I was very, very fortunate. I had a family that um, before I got married had told me that um, they wanted me. My parents told me, sat me down and said, we don't care who you marry, but we want you to be a bridge between cultures. And funny enough, I didn't set out to do that, but that's just how it happened. <laughs> And um, so they were very happy in that sense. And they told me when I embraced Islam, they said, we're happy as long as you're happy. And so they respected everything that I chose. They respected my husband and uh, the choice for me to cover came a few years after I embraced Islam. And, you know, they might've had questions that they didn't ask me or anything. I think the only thing I might've gotten asked is, aren't you hot in that? Because when I would go home to visit, my brother-in-law was in the house, you know, they lived with my parents to help caretake them. And so I always had to wear hijab in the house. So you're going on vacation and at home, you know, you can take it off and relax and be yourself. And um, so when I would go there, maybe for a month, I would have to wear hijab basically all the time unless I was in my private room. So they were extremely respectful and even um, asked, you know, certain questions like, you know, uh, for my brother-in-law, they would say, oh, Tom is coming in, you know, so make sure cover. So they were very respectful. And I'm very fortunate because there's some people who are not, you know, they're, they're, they're having to hide it in their family. So Alhamdulillah, I, I, I was very lucky. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. I had something similar, I think, from both of you. I had one cousin who um, we were raised together in Mexico. I remember my first trip or second trip. I think it was my first trip, but um, she was very hurt. She's the most religious within our family and she practices, she's Catholic. And I mean, she goes to mass every morning and the whole nine yards. And um, so she has her afternoon prayer and, you know, I've seen her um, um, be so um, committed uh, besides my grandmother. Uh, but my grandmother passed away a couple years ago. So I remember the first time she, um, she was so upset and, um, and she yanked the hijab off of me and she slapped me and she said, you know, snap out of it. You're never going to be Arab. And I was so appalled. I was like, but I'm not trying to be Arab. You have no idea <laughs> how proud I am to be um, Mexican, you know, especially among Muslims. So I take a lot of pride in saying that I'm Mexican. And, and so it, it, it just went over her head. And as she was coming to slap me again with the other hand, I was like, okay, well, wait a minute, would Jesus be happy with you? <laughs> and um, she ended up kicking me out and said, you know, I don't want you here. And that was the most difficult for me. Um, and so subhanAllah, it was, uh, it was a few months. And the thing was that I had to call her house to talk to my grandmother. So uh, I would pick up, call, and if it was her, I would hang up. And, you know, it took courage to eventually, um, you know, a call and she picked up. And, you know, I remember I made a lot of dua. I said, Ya Allah, please soften her heart, open her heart, you know. And eventually, I think it was about four months after I came back from that vacation that she, I, I called and I said, Bismillah. <laughs> whatever it's good either she's gonna hang up on me or either she's gonna say hi and she literally said hi as if nothing ever happened you know she's like how are you how's Andrew and and so our relationship completely changed there after after that we had a conversation not very thorough but we had a, a, a she apologized and when I came back the following year she was waiting um for me with actual hijabs that she purchased for me after taking it off <laughs> every time she went somewhere on vacation she saw these scarves and she would buy them so she had a little stack for me she's like well at every travel you know that I go around the republic you know Mexico you know I think of you now 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 I buy I buy these for you so um, it was gradually and obviously um, even when we would go out subhanAllah I remember um she would grab Andrew and go ahead of me 
and would tell everybody in the store that I was coming, you know, she's like, she's Muslim, like as if I needed introduction kind of, or like as if uh, people were going to be um, aggressive towards me. So that started um, slowing down throughout the years. But um, my other question for, for, for our conversation today, you know, we have someone saying here that it's difficult to wear hijab. Um, I sometimes don't wear it because it's hard or I forget to put it on. I wear it about 85% of the time. And to be honest, I feel ugly. Sometimes I miss my curly hair. Um, and so <laughs> on the contrary, I am so grateful because nobody knows if I had a bad hair day, uh, number one. And number two, honestly, for me personally, um, I feel like we see a lot of, um, you know, infographics that say, you know, your hijab is your crown or what have you. I honestly, I don't see myself without it. And I personally feel that I look better with hijab. And then, you know, you, you get to like cover this and, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> um, so I see more good. Um, but as far as, you know, it's obviously you, you have to educate yourself when it comes to hijab and understanding that it is a greater purpose. And what I mean by that is that we're doing it for the pleasure of Allah, right? And because he, he instructed, um, and perhaps Jackie, you can read that ayah for us, um, where Allah is telling us. And we have to understand another thing that, you know, that ayah or those ayahs about the head covering or about the modesty did not come until, you know, in a lap of 13 years. So they didn't come automatically. And so the, the, our journey or our process doesn't have to happen overnight. I've heard sisters that the day they take shahada, they put it on and they don't take it off. And while that's good, we need to make sure that we are looking at ourselves and not comparing ourselves to anyone because our story and our journey is individual. It's us. So we need to make sure we don't overwhelm ourselves and then we don't burden ourselves with more than we can handle. Wouldn't you agree, Sister Jackie? Yeah, and to that viewer's point, you know, for me personally, it took a long time to perf to start perfecting my hijab because, you know, nobody's perfect. I'm still not perfect, subhanAllah. Um, and everyone has a need, and I certainly had a need to feel good about myself as I walked out the door. Um, whatever that meant, you know, we, we want to, you know, feel clean. We want to feel like our skin is flawless and that, you know, we're out and we're wearing something that we feel good in. And fashion was a big part of my life um, before I converted and became a part even after. So um, when I was in high school, I, three of the four years, I wanted to be a fashion designer. I learned how to sew. I sewed some of my own clothes. I would you know, watch all the shows. And at some point I realized that, you know, trends are just recycling over and over again. And it, it seemed boring to me. So I decided to study in my last year, um, you know, people. So I did sociology and anthropology instead, because I'm like, that's always going to be interesting. It's never going <laughs> to bore me. <laughs> so, but I still wanted to look good. And that, that carried, you know, forward. So um, when I converted, I, I, you know, followed all of like the Muslim fashion blog, they really did make me feel more comfortable that I could express myself, you know, and still be modest. But I can tell you, if I looked at myself when I first converted in a picture to today, that, you know, I might cringe and be like, oh, that shirt's a little tight, or wow, I was wearing like, you know, skinny jeans uh, and like a long, you know, uh, just a cover up in the front, but like the front is still kind of tight. And, um, so what I would have considered modest then is not the same of what I consider modest today. Um, so it, it really is, it's like Nahila said, it's a, it's a personal journey that, you know, okay, so you have the intention in your heart and you're struggling with hijab. That's something Allah SWT will reward you for. Don't stop, you know, don't let it discourage you. Um, Strengthen in your heart first, like keep that for your first intention. Learn more and strengthen in your heart first and the hijab will follow. And that really did hold true to me because, um, you know, as I was learning, I was increasing my modesty. And also, you know, this may, this is something that 
uh, is more realistic. It's expensive to change your entire wardrobe. So, you know, you convert, you didn't get, you know, $500 to buy a whole new wardrobe of like uh, new modest clothes that are not, you know, tight on you. So, you know, I tried my best to just buy cover-ups so I could keep like the clothes that I had, but I had like, you know, some coverage or whatever. So uh, that's why it's, it's so important for us to be, you know, gracious with one another um, because you don't know where that person is in that situation. Uh, and uh, it could be as simple as they just, they want to change and they just don't have the um, to do so or something like that. So, um, but I don't know if you want to comment on that before I go into the IAT, but uh, that was just something I, I really wanted to, to say. Actually, very similar to you, I went to the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandise. So I actually wanted to be a fashion designer as well, but I went into merchandise marketing. Um, and so uh, I always, that's one of the hardest things I think for me was the fact that I was so into fashion as well. And at some point I, I thought I was going to go into um I just wanted to change my major because it was such a struggle within myself. But then again, like you said, you know, it's just finding your style, finding what works for you. And similar to, I think all three of us, we went through that journey of, you know, a turban. I remember the first time I went to Mexico, I went with a turban and a turtleneck in August and it's hot and everybody's looking at me like, are you crazy? <laughs> because I was trying to be modest, but I was trying to also, um, you know, not look so different. And as I started gradually going, my attire started changing uh, to where I adapted a bias. And again, you know, that's solely because I chose, not because it's it, you have to or it's mandatory. And I want to make that very clear. Um, it's, it's not mandatory to wear an actual abaya, an Arab looking abaya or what have you. That's not the, the obligation of the modesty that is required upon us. It's to be covered, right? Not fitted. Um, I personally love abayas. They're just very easy. You just put them on and go. Um, but yeah, you're right. It, it becomes very expensive. Um, but even then, there's several organizations out there that have come out um, to help sisters with modesty, um, where they give you the first to buy in a couple hijabs. I know that a friend had one. Um, and so Allah will never give us anything that we cannot handle. It's, it's actually up to us to um, understand why we're doing things. And like you said, the intention is essential when it comes to, um, you know, our modesty and our hijab. And, and obviously, it's more than just um, the head covering. So yeah, if, if you can, do you want to add anything, Sister Arenda, or should we? Well, I think your points that you made are absolutely perfect. We have a viewer that is asking that um, they teach at a Sunday school and sisters wear hijab only at the mosque. And they asked if there's any reminders or points of reinforcement that we can share to plant the seed to encourage them to wear you know, hijab outside of the mosque. And I, I would just like to speak on that because that used to be me. Um, and I think that when I first started going to the mosque that we did that out of respect because we felt like that's what everybody there was doing. Everybody was covered. And so out of respect, we would do that. And when we know we're going to Allah's house, but again, like what sister Nahela just reinforced is that education. So giving them, no matter who's going to tell you what you should do, or you know, it's obligatory or whatever, it's still that journey you have to get to that point of understanding yourself. And so when you get to that point of understanding yourself, that's gonna come through being closer to Allah and understanding who Allah is and why we're doing what we're doing to please Allah. And so I think that those points are definitely will tie into the ayah that um, Sister Jack Jacqueline will share. Um, but you know, we can always, in, encourage each other but we also have to support each other in that journey that personal journey and that is the key part because for me I had that personality that if someone's going to tell me I have to do it I'm probably going to be the last person to do it <laughs> not not that I'm proud of that that personality trait but you know my husband respected that I said I know I have to wear a hijab this is part of something I understand but I have to do it in my time and he totally respected that. And the people around me did as well. And that's what helped me come to my realization 
that this is what I want to do. Because, um, this is what's going to please my creator. To that point as well, um, I remember, you know, when I when I first got married, my husband would drive me to the masjid on Friday from work. And, and so work clothes is a whole nother, you know, thing. If you're not working like in a Muslim organization, having like cute, modest work clothes is a whole nother fun, you know, shopping trip. But um, there would be times when I would call him and I'd be like, honey, please bring me this, you know, uh, open a bias so I can wear it over my clothes. And one day I realized, um, you know, I don't feel comfortable walking into a Los Paranatiles house with what I have on. And so that means like, I don't feel comfortable. Like if I need to go to a masjid just to pray with what I'm wearing. And I want to always feel like I'm comfortable going to a Los Paranatiles house. I want to feel, you know, like I'm doing, I'm pleasing a Los Paranatiles. And so that kind of triggered me to start to change my wardrobe even more, making it more modest because I didn't want to be in situation where you know I didn't feel comfortable going to worship because of what I was wearing um and I I truly wanted to please the West Grand Hotel at the time it didn't make sense to me like why would I need someone to bring the clothes if I'm already wearing clothes to go to the mystery you know um so so that really uh kind of clicked in my head like I I don't want to have to be caught ever you know outside not being able to um go into a masjid. Um, I want to feel like I'm ready to worship um, because I want to always be remembering Allah SWT because I love him and I want to be close to him. And that's what that feeling that you're talking about, Arinda, that we're trying to grow in people. And once you have that feeling, you know, hijab follows, subhanAllah. Um, going to those um, ayat, so I I did, I'm not a scholar, I'm going to do a, <laughs> a little, uh, you know, an announcement there, but uh, I do love to learn. And um, I did pick three different ayats that were popular about modesty. Um, and from, you know, from beginning to end, like when they were revealed. So uh, the first uh, ayat that I found that was, was revealed first uh, is chapter 7, uh, verse 26. And it says, O children of Adam, says, O children of Adam, we have bestowed uh, raiment upon you to cover yourselves. Green your private parts and as adornments and as an adornment. And the raiment of righteousness is better, such as one who not prove evidences and verses uh, of a Lord that they may uh, remember. And so this is first, you know, talking to us that we cover our private parts and that it is a reflection of righteousness. So it puts that kind of you know, intention on it. And this one was revealed first. And then after uh, that was revealed, verse tw chapter 24, verse 30 and 31. Oh, sorry. No, chapter 33, verse 59 was revealed. And this was um, the, the verse that when the, the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to ask his wives to go out uh, and cover themselves as a protection, you know, from the attention so that they could be comfortable in public. Um, and so Allah's parent house says, O Prophet, tell your wives that your daughters and the women of believers to draw their cloaks all over their bodies, uh, that will be better that they shouldn't be known. Um, so as not to be annoyed and Allah is ever all forgiving and most versatile. So Allah's parental established, um, you know, holding and covering yourself as a, a righteous behavior and then also one of protection, uh, toward, you know, you as a woman. And then, uh, the famous verse, <laughs> verse 24 uh, or chapter 24, verse 30 and 31, that actually uh, kind of goes more into what is covering me. Um, verse 30, it says, tell the believing men to lower their gaze and protect their private parts. That is pure for them. Verily, Allah is all aware of what they do. And so a lot of people, when you talk about modesty, they leave out this verse, even though it's like right before the other one. 
um, that you know the first protection of modesty is lowering your gaze. That if you see something immodest, that you don't look at it. You know, you protect yourself from that. Um, and so it's it's so important because modesty is not just what we wear. It's you know how we talk, what we say. Um, it's very in, important um, in our character. Uh, so I think that that's always important to include. Uh, and then the following verse in, in chapter 24 is verse 31. And that's the one that goes more into detail about women's dressing. And it says, and tell the believing women to lower their gaze and protect their private parts, not to show off the moments except only which is apparent, necessary and to draw their veils all over um, you know, their, their necks and their chest area and not to reveal their adornments except to their husbands or their fathers or their husbands' fathers or their sons or their husbands' sons or their brothers or their brothers' sons or their sisters' sons or the women, uh, the Muslim women, um, their sisters in Islam or female slaves from whom the right hand possesses or old male servants who lack vigor or small children who have no sense of sexuality and let them not stamp their feet so to reveal what they hide from their adornment. And all you beg Allah to forgive you all, O believer, that you may be successful. So imagine all those regulations come in this huge, you know, verse, but only after we've already established the understanding of modesty, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started by revealing, you know, uh, this understanding in us of righteousness, modesty, and protection, and then brought on the regulations in accordance to uh, a very small part of this verse of sexuality. Um, so uh, that, you know, understanding that before embracing Islam and before, uh, um, it, and before trying to be modest, helped shape my understanding of modesty as a new Muslim. You lost my to forgive me if what I'm saying is incorrect and correct me if what I'm saying is wrong. But um, that was something that really did shape uh, me as a modest, you know, Muslim Muslim. And I think it goes back to the whole education, right? And understanding, understanding your journey. And this goes for both online and offline. And what I mean by that is that today, the online circle is very, very large, right? And so the same way you're going to act offline in person, you need to act online. And so it's very unfortunate that today, you know, uh, I get this all the time. And I think we've mentioned this in the past, Sister Arenda and I, where subhanAllah, you know, there's a lot of um, disrespect from the opposite gender towards us. Uh, I mentioned this last week. It's not flattering at all whatsoever. On the contrary, it's it's the very um, disappointing in, in the sense of the lack of education that we have on our dean. Right, that tells us that they haven't understood these verses, uh, how eloquently you have uh, lined them up, Sister Jackie, to understand that even uh, you know with our eyes, we need to lower our gaze, right? So we have no business looking at pages that are inappropriate. We have no business listening to inappropriateness. Um, and again, the same way we want to act in public, we want to act in the privacy of our home where more people can actually see us online um, and we can be exposed in, in, in a matter of seconds now with technology, right? So there's a sister that wrote in and she's a fellow Mexican uh, who says that basically she put on her hijab and then took it off and it's been difficult. I'm summarizing, uh, su summarizing it because it's a little lengthy um, and she wants to start wearing it again uh, she said, you know, I guess as a convert, sometimes I feel like my past haunts me. And then I start worrying about how my family in Mexico would react any advice. And so I think, you know, uh, I, patience is number one. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about sabr, right? Over and over and over. And it was the patience that allow me um, and allow my family to see that I became a better Nahela that Nahela didn't, uh, you know, disappear per se, 
I'm still their aunt, I'm still their niece, I'm still their cousin, you know, their granddaughter. I'm just a better version of myself that I actually respect myself uh, so much so that I want to please my creator. And then uh, my advice is, you know, we have uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe, you know, and that's the best example. And that's how I, I actually had that conversation with my family. It's Virgin Mary, but the Mexican Virgin Mary, um, where, you know, she has a veil and we see Virgin Mary with the veil. So this is not foreign, uh, even within our cultures. I'm talking about Latin America or, or the three monotheistic religions. Uh, Abrahamic religions where we are all supposed to be covered and it's in Corinthus in the Bible. I can't remember the exact, I think it's five and six Corinthus. Um, and please forgive me if the number is wrong, but I know it's in Corinthus where it, it, uh, God also tells, you know, the believing women uh, in this scripture to, um, to cover. Uh, and so it's important for us to educate ourselves about our Dean and why we wear it and understand it in order to have the confidence we need when we get asked. And that's one of the things that I was, I was so scared on my first visit to Mexico, but I think uh, the fact that I went over and over to the Sheikh, like I went every week to the Sheikh, I'm like, okay, do I hug my cousins? Do I greet them? Do I this? Do I that? And I kept going with all these questions to the Sheikh before my first initial trip to Mexico, because obviously we are trying to practice our religion to the best of our ability. And there's wisdom behind everything where we need to come with mercy and compassion when we're delivering and conveying this message of Al-Islam, because you can be the only person, you are the messenger that is being sent to your family. Therefore, you might be the only person, the only Muslim that they will come across. And so we have to be gentle as well. And I think a lot of us, and I'm talking um, about a lot of Latin American sisters and brothers have made, uh, unfortunately, that mistake of, you know, thinking that you're going to convert everyone overnight. It's not going to happen. Allah is the one that guide us and he's the one that can actually guide. So we have to erase that off our heads um, and understand that that's not our job. Our job is to convey the message with uh, kindness and mercy and compassion and be the best we can be what Islam has taught us. So in Mexico, um, now when I go and I've been going for, I don't know, over 10 years with hijab, you know, there's more and more. It is growing. It's still very, very foreign. I mean, you know, you're you're not seen as a Mexican. You're seen as a foreigner. So when somebody's selling something to you, even if I'm speaking Spanish, they'll be speaking English back to me because they can't see past the headscarf, right? So I'm like, I'm speaking to you with your dialect, with your tone, or I'm trying to mimic it. And um, so again, we just have to have um, information. The other thing that I want to um, recommend, and I know if Daniel's on here, he's going to be very happy about this, but something I carry in my purse all the time, and here's my purse, um, I always carry pamphlets, right? So sometimes we may not have the time or they may not be able to listen. So I always carry actually those two in Spanish, hijab in Spanish and hijab in English, because obviously we are walking dawa, right? We are, I mean, this is our dawa and, and the way that we act and react. And, and so I always carry these because I've always gone asked about the hijab, um, especially when I speak Spanish, They're like, wait, you don't have an accent. Why? Where did you learn Spanish so well? <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm Mexican. So um, my advice to you is to get to know your Dean and be, be gentle with yourself. It is a journey. Um, and reassess your intention, reassess why you're doing things, um, and have that talk, the, uh, talk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make a lot of dua. I mean, dua is our weapon and you make dua to make it easy for you. You make it, um, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for those, um, that are in your circle. And finally, my last advice to this would be your circle of friends. It's very, very, 
very important your circle of friends. So um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says basically that, you know, we become who our friends are, whether we like it or not, you know, those habits, we're habitual individuals. So those habits, we will actually um, start going back, like you said here, you keep going back to your old ways. Um, and so you might have to reassess your circle or, you know, Sometimes you have to do it. You have to cut off friends that are not good for you. I mean, I had a friend that was cursing left and right. And it's like, you're making my ears bleed, not because I don't know the words, but because I'm trying to be a better person here. And you're just not doing that for me, you know, and my faith teaches me this. And so um, I had to detach and kind of sometimes unfriend those who will not take us to Jannah, because that's our ultimate goal for all of us go to heaven, right? So um, th that's my advice on that. Ladies, you're more than welcome to um, give her I some advice. To, I wanted to add a little bit of advice that um, sometimes when we feel like um, other people's opinions are affecting our actions, that's where we really need to self-evaluate, like Sister Mahela said. And um, that relationship between you and Allah needs to be strengthened because ultimately our goal is to please Allah. And so our actions will carry based on who we're trying to please. If we're trying to please those around us, those actions might not align with what Allah says is best for us and whatever Allah says is best for us. That's what we want to do because that's ultimately what's going to bring us to Jannah inshallah. So um, also, um, I just wanted to share a little story about my mom because um, she's 75 years old. She embraced Islam Alhamdulillah last year. So it's been a year and a little over a year. And she is kind of negate from the obligation of covering because of her age. However, and I haven't shared this with my Embrace sisters yet, she has decided to cover full time. Oh, and so it was, a big, it was a big decision because Texas heat, she comes from Montana. My dad passed away last year, so we brought her here. And the reason she really chose to move to Texas is because she converted to Islam and she had a Muslim community to help support that decision. And so she could be more educated. And so because she's in a circle of people that are under the same goal and in life as her, that's helping her to continue to build her faith in, in, in her Iman. So even I tell her she gets so hot because when she first came here, she's like, oh my gosh, it's so hot. I, you know, if I wear hijab to class, I feel like I'm choking, you know? And so we would try to adjust it and wear light hijab, you know, something that's breathable in the heat. Um, and even though I keep telling her, you know, mom, you know, you don't have to wear hijab. She's like, I know I want to wear it because this makes Allah happy. You know, this is what I want to do. And so that is what's important. Like Sister Nehela said, surrounding yourself with people that are on the common goal. So if you find yourself worrying more about what other people are thinking, you need to evaluate who is it you're around, number one. And number two, that relationship between you and Allah that only comes with dua, with prayer, with, with reading, with educating yourself, with talking with other sisters who've had the same struggles. And so I just wanted to share that little piece there and um, for the sister who had asked that question. Michelle. Yeah, additionally, um, I, I was, I've been blessed to be very close to my family. Uh, and that was something I was terrified of losing, you know, as I embraced this land. And I knew that I wouldn't lose them completely, but I also knew that I was going, I was about to make them very uncomfortable <laughs> around me. And that happened, you know, that was a couple years of them, you know, just really not understanding or being uncomfortable. So um, what I had to do was try to emotionally distance myself without physically distancing, distancing that from them, because I didn't, I wanted to make sure that they were close. I wanted them to have that I'm still who I am, that I still love them with all my heart because I, you know, I love my mom more than anything, you know, in the world and um, that I haven't changed you know, as a person, even though I'm changing on the outside. So sometimes like when I very first started wearing hijab, I wouldn't wear hijab in the house, no matter like who came in, if it was like someone that was, you know, in our family, but they would see me putting hijab on as you know, I had it on coming in and I had it on going out. Uh, and as you know, that increased, I would wear it in the house, you know, when, you know, men who were not my brother were in, you know, the home. Um, and it started to become normal over time. 
Uh, so just echoing that patience and just preparing yourself to be uncomfortable. Um, you know, it, that is okay. We don't, none of us want to like lose family over this. Allah's parent gave us that family for a reason. You know, we, we love them and we were born into them. Um, and it's, it's okay to have some mercy on them for them not understanding, you know, your position. Um, but just really have patience and I, I purposely and intentionally kind of ease them into my changing. Um, I wouldn't tell them if I was going to pray right away because I didn't want to make them uncomfortable. Um, and then I made steps, intentional steps of, like, okay, today's my first time where I refused my mom's, you know, food because it's not had And then uh, she eventually started going to a had butcher when I would come over. So, subhanAllah. Uh, it took a very, you know, lots of small calculated steps to get them to a point where they um, are comfortable now being around me and we have that close relationship again. But for a while, we were a little distant. Mashallah, mashallah. I think we've all been very blessed uh, as far as, you know, being able, it is a blessing to be able to be in communities where we're able to grow. Uh, together and you know with embrace we also have a sisters network um, where we actually uh, you know embrace one another on whatever level you come in so we want to uh, invite uh, uh, everyone we do meet every Saturday online at 9 a.m central time and so we meet for two hours and um, sister Renda maybe you can say uh, our little what our little agenda is Sure. So we actually started this after a little bit before the pandemic, well, actually probably around the time the pandemic started where we were told to stay home and we couldn't meet in person anymore. So we wanted to find a way to still feel connected and have the sisters not feel so alone because as converts, that's something we often feel. Um, and so when you find your tribe of people, you feel very alone if you aren't able to see them or talk to them. So we started an online chat and to kind of initiate, we always want the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what we do is we um, we meet for two hours that enables some sisters to come in. If they can't be there the whole time, at least they can pop in and say hello. And we'll show like a short motivational Islamic video for three to five minutes. And it gives us something to reflect upon and share our thoughts on whatever that video talks about. And, and it opens up other discussions, maybe struggles sisters are having in their, their own journey or their life. And so we're all there to support each other. And like Sister Nahela said, you know, there's sisters from all over the US, US and uh, other parts of the world as well. So we have someone from Brazil. We have someone from England that's tuned in. We have someone from uh, Mexico City. And so, um, you know, we all come from different cultures in the world, but we're all here to be better Muslims. And so that's what our goal is, um, to create that sisterhood and support system. So we want to open the invitation for every every sister out there. Um, and at Embrace, we are also, I mean, that is our niche, that we are here to support um, our convert community. So brothers and sisters, we do have weekly halakas that are on this uh, platform, as well as tonight, we have a hadith rush happening uh, once a week on Thursday evenings. So there's, there's um, support out there. I know oftentimes people are uh, longing for a community. We've heard um, people that travel anywhere from two to five hours to get to a mosque. And, you know, now that we're in this uh, situation with uh, the pandemic, it's very difficult. And like Sister Brenda said, it can get very, very lonely. So we wanna make sure that you don't feel lonely. Nobody's left out, whether you're a brother or sister, there are halakas here that are conducted by, you know, um, we have scholars, uh, alhamdulillah, who are also converts, mashallah, tabarakallah. Tomorrow we have a reminder here as well. And tomorrow it's our, um, our beloved Imam uh, Wesley Lebron, who happens to be Puerto Rican, uh, mashallah. So we are very diverse as well. Sheikh Jassy is African-American. And so we just wanna make sure that you understand that you don't have to compromise anything as far as when uh, modesty goes. And what I mean by that is that you can, you know, um, when I think about that, about not compromising our modesty, I think about my indigenous Muslims in Chiapas, Mexico, right? They have 
um, kept their attire because it's long skirts anyways, uh, which are wool, uh, but they uh, added on the headscarf. And so it's so beautiful to be able to keep on traditions. And we see this around the globe, uh, different Muslim um, identities and, and countries where they, uh, they keep on their garments, um, their uh, cultural garments, and then they implement the hijab. So um, subhanAllah, this was such a fruitful, I hope it was a very beneficial conversation. Any last words or words of encouragement or um, any last advice that any of you want to give uh, both our sisters and brothers when it comes to modesty that never, um, never gets out of fashion. So we got to forget that, that modesty is always in fashion. Uh, SubhanAllah, the, the biggest advice I can give to, you know, uh, sisters who are trying to embrace modesty more fully or people who are trying to encourage others to embrace modesty more fully is to uh, first encourage them to uh, grow closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and encourage yourself to grow closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, do the, and mark those intentions. We did get a question one time on how do, you know, as a man, how do I help, you know, a, a woman embrace her hijab? And, um, you know, my advice was encourage her to grow her deen and, and introduce her to other women that you think are good Muslims. Uh, and that is what's really, really important, you know, what's in our heart. Um, because this world will judge you on your results and your outside appearance, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges you on your intentions and your efforts. Um, and that's what we need to be here. Awesome. Very, very important. You are judged on your intentions. And so even though you might not be to that end journey yet, that intention that you're continuing to try to strive to get to that point is what's important. So always remember that. Don't be discouraged by anyone around you, if they're not encouraging you, find the people that do encourage you. And remember that um, you know, you're there to please your creator, not the people. And um, you, you don't want to um, be too harsh on yourself too. I know like the sister had said, you know, I struggled so much and I took it off and then um, you lose your hand. So you will find, this is kind of um, a reminder constantly. The, the way you dress and you go out in public, you do look totally different from the other people. But when you are doing that for the right reason and you're doing it for Allah and you have that connection between you and Allah, it doesn't matter what people think and you're gonna walk around just like Sister Nahila said, you, you don't even remember you have it on. It's just a part of you. And sometimes you'll find if you don't have it on properly, you feel awkward. So it, it is a journey. Be patient with yourself. Always make the intention to go forward and um, reach out to those around you that can help you in that journey. And I want to end with uh, a hadith uh, from our beloved prophet, peace be upon him. He says, barely there is a special morality of every religion and the special morality of Islam is modesty. So I want to end on that note and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for each one of us. I ask that Allah brings us closer to him uh, through our modesty, not only the type of modesty that can be seen uh, exterior, but interior. And um, remember that we want to make sure that we practice the same modesty inside our homes, outside our homes, and in this world of uh, what we call the world war, world war web. So um, until next time, this was an episode, our 10th episode, mashallah, of, of Reverts Reality. If you have any uh, topics that we, you would like us to cover, please feel free to inbox us or send a message below, leave a comment, and we'll make sure to address it as we get to the to those topics. Uh, again, thank you so much, ladies, for this conversation. And Jazakallah Hair, until next Thursday, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.